Clarity on Fire, a podcast for people who know what they don't want out of their life and career, but aren't sure what they'd rather be doing. In a world where it's easy to exist, but hard to feel alive, we, Kristen and Rachel, two certified life and career coaches, are here to help you cut through the information overload, get unstuck, and focus not just on how you can have a career you're passionate about, but how to create a whole life that feels fulfilling. So join us here, where we serve up inspiration and down-to-earth wisdom in a way that only two best friends can. We want you to experience the relief of knowing that, yes, you're allowed to want more out of your life and career. And no, you don't have to wander through the dark anymore. Our job is to light the fire that shows you the way. Let's go. Hey. Hey. It's not too late. What is it not too late for? Oh, you could have just said for what? (laughs) But okay. (laughs) Oh my God, that's so funny. Put a pin in that. I'm going to tell you why that's funny when we're done recording. Um, For you to join us for our Patreon community meetup on Sunday, hosted by Madison, our community ambassador. And this one featuring a a guest Very special one. Um... Francisca Hernandez is going to be doing a breath work workshop for us. It's going to be 90 minutes. It's going to be a luxurious 90 minutes. Mm-hmm. Actually, I don't promise luxury because... It might be intense. Breath work is intense. It but brings I, up some emotions. I'm going. But Francisca is the best person to shepherd you through that experience. Yeah, she's really great. So if you want to come meet other Clay Down Fire people, and you want to experience something you might never have experienced before, a cool healing modality, a cool technique. With someone we very, very highly recommend. Know, like, and trust. Then Also love. Yes. Then what are you doing? Pay $6. Join the flame tier and get yourself access to that. And then like everything All else All the other happens, benefits. Which I'm not even going to bore you with because you can just go to Clarity on Fire. Or I'm sorry. Well, you could do that too. But you could also just go to patreon.com slash Clarity on Fire. Oh, you can go to Clarity on Fire.com slash community or patreon.com slash Clarity on Fire. You, Whoa. You said that those were like, you said that like those were going to be perfectly in. I did think it was going to be for a second. And, and then, then as I went. keep going and it wasn't as cool <laughs> as you thought it was going to be. Correct. It's, well, Correct. we're calling that. It also, sounded... I, have to, I have to move this. You have a gray hair that's hanging <gasps> down in the middle of your face and I oh, can't no. stand Pull it out. Looking Pull at it out. On air? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, what if it's not gray and it's just blonde and like. It might be blonde. Hold on. Let me take a gander. No, that's that's gray. That's, oh, I think man. that's you guys. I mean, I'm getting old. I don't know. Got gray hair. It could be blonde. Actually, I might have made made a mistake. No, I that, think that is, might be blonde. That is blonde. That is not gray. Well, congrats. Her. I just Call pulled out, out normal hair. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh man, poor AJ. This is his episode. And what if he's listening to this? Um, okay. Well, congrats. You you have one less gray hair than you thought. Negative. You have one less hair. <laughs> Period. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> um, okay, so join okay, us for join, work join on Sunday. Patreon, join the community. We're going to have some time to get to chat with each other too. So you'll get to do breath work. Yeah. There's going to also be Just everyone general, else in the community. General and chat. Make some friends. Um, so yes, do that before Sunday. Sunday, Sunday and- the 25th at 2 p.m. Eastern for 90 minutes. Mm-hmm. Just, just so you know, pencil it in and then join us for that. Yep. Link okay. in episode notes. Now, should we introduce AJ, <laughs> who is our expert for today? Yes. Go ahead and pull up his bio and okay. you can read it. Um, it was a very interesting conversation and I learned a lot. Mm-hmm. I can already tell we're going to be oh, you weren't a here lot for this. We should probably tell them one. you weren't here for this. No, one. I was not here for this one, Rachel. Usually we interview experts together, but this time Rachel just interviewed this expert. That's um, fine. I have plenty so to say. I haven't heard it yet, but I already, I've heard the highlight reel and I know this is one I'm going to be referring back to many times. Yeah. So I'm already imagining some future clients coming back and listening to yeah. me saying this right now. Okay. AJ. AJ is a talent and human potential aficionado with over a decade of experience within career coaching and human resources and has been featured in NBC, CBS, Fox, the International Business Times, and Yahoo News. He is currently CEO of The Human Reach, 
a human potential institute guiding high achieving professionals to land their dream careers in record time and coaching Silicon Valley leaders to be thoughtful, effective leaders. His most previous role was as a Facebook global HR leader. He has supported global teams of over 3,000 people and launched many innovative leadership programs that are still in full swing at Facebook today. So he has some creds. He knows what he's talking about. He definitely about. has some street cred. And I I asked him to like give me the the deets on like what is up with getting a job now because this is not our zone of genius. We are very transparent about the fact that this is not our zone of genius. And it is more so his. And mm-hmm. um, so I was very eager to to pick his brain. And I did. And we're now we're sharing good. it with you. Yeah, we're very good at the front end of who are you and what do you even want out of your life and career? But then you get to a certain part where you're like, okay, I know what I want, but now I have to apply for jobs. And like, what's the best way to do that? And what are the tips and the tricks? And networking. And we're not the tips and the trick people. So we've learned a thing or two and we we share it with our clients. We do have some tricks up our sleeves, but we don't profess to be the experts, especially on the most current experience. And we are in a weird one right now. I'm sure you asked AJ about- about job COVID searching stuff. during COVID. So um, lots of good nuggets to get into here. Well, you're, you're saying that, but you're going well, to have to listen to find out. We've shared some of the good nuggets, but I'm sure there's some that I don't even know yet. Okay, well, you and, and Kristen are going to go listen now. Mm-hmm. Hi, AJ. Hi, Rachel. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm, I, we're doing this on a Friday and I hate being one of those people who's glad it's Friday, but I can't, I kind of can't stop being that person. You know, like it's too ingrained. Fair. That is so fair. I I always look forward to Fridays. Fridays are my day that I block off half my day. I end my day at 12 noon Pacific so I can kind of ease into the weekend. So I am right there with you, girl. I'm ready. I'm ready for Well, it's weekend. it's 1 p.m. Pacific. Or no, it's not. What time is it? I have no idea it's what a, time it is. It's 11. No, it's 11. We're good. We're yeah. good. After this, so you're going to be done. Yeah. This is your last thing. Um, I know. I love, what a way to end. I love that you end your day at noon on Fridays. Um, we can talk a little bit more when we, when we get to there about like, I feel like that's probably one of the reasons you started working for yourself was because you wanted more freedom to control things like when I left for the day on a Friday. Um, so I guess let's just dive in because I've read your story on your site, but I, no one else who's listening to this knows your story. So, um, you want to give them like the, you know, whatever version of your story you want to tell, like, I'm ready to hear it. Down and dirty. Yeah. So let's yeah. see. Um, the the TLDR is that I yeah. I, I grew up in, um, in the Bay Area and I went to school in New York, studied organizational communication and design, came back to the Bay Area um, in the recession and mm-hmm. couldn't find a job. In, in organizational design or HR. Um, and so I ended up working a job in sales. And I was working at a luxury sports resort company selling memberships to the wealthy. And I quickly learned in about six months time that that was not the job for me. And I wanted to get <laughs> back into a role where I could be um, in a leadership role and, and, and helping to design and lead organizations. Although I was great at sales, I, um, I, I didn't enjoy it. And so I, I worked as an assistant general manager for the San Francisco Bay Club. Uh, after, shortly after that, I got the job um, as a 22-year-old, never worked um, in hospitality before in my life. But I got it through um, a way that I was able to pitch one of the, the VPs about what I would do in my first 30, 60, 90 days. Mm. So we can talk about that maybe later. Oh, but, yeah. Let's, um, I'll put a pin in that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I got the job. It was incredible. I was able to bring that property up to the top property in the portfolio. Um, and then I was asked to do the same thing for all eight properties on the Western Seaboard. So that kind of got me started in training and development. And from there, I went into recruiting uh, for tech companies in the Bay Area for three and a half years, ended up leading a team there. Um, it was it was fantastic. Um, and one of my clients at Premier, the staffing firm hired me to be the VP of People and Engagement for is a solar software company based in Oakland. So I led the people team, talent acquisition, learning and development, employee relations I, I helped with. Um, so the kind of the whole gamut. And then uh, most recently, I was at Facebook for the past almost four years. And I was a senior HR leader there, helping to support a team of 3,000 people globally. And 
<laughs> it was a lot. Yep. It's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it was a it was a giant job. Super. The learning curve was huge, and I worked with the smartest people of my career. It was the, the best job I've ever had. Got to find Frank. And I made a really tough decision in 2020 to go off on my own and become a full-time coach and career strategist and HR consultant. And so I've, I've launched my company. In uh, 2020? What month 20, of 2020? Uh, September. Okay. So like during the pandemic, right I'm just wondering if you were like one of those people who's like, I'm quitting my job. Uh, I do know someone who did that in like February or like late January, 2020, and then had a very interesting you know, rude awakening a little bit happened, but yours was an intentional choice. It was. And I, you know, I was actually um, thinking about leaving in March of 2020. And I put the, I put the brakes on because of the pandemic. And then very serendipitously, I had some clients, uh, potential clients reach out to me and they're like, Hey, do you want to work for us? And that gave me the insurance policy, quote unquote, that I needed to jump. So. Okay. So a long and varied history, but also one that I can, I'm already seeing the pattern of you made a lot of it yourself, like by just maybe having the audacity to ask for things that were potentially outside the realm of what you were, you know, technically qualified for or capable of at that time. Definitely want to talk to you about that. Actually, let's just start there because why not? I mean, it's, it's very relevant because I think that's one of the things that the people that Kristen and I coach or who listen to this struggle with a lot is, I mean, isn't it something we all struggle with and a lot, I guess, like the not enoughness and the feeling like, who am I to do that? And the logical brain is just really good at kind of sabotaging us when we're looking at a potential job. Well, like I'm not, I couldn't do that and just dismiss. So what made you go, I could do that. (laughs) And that first job when you were like 22, what made you go, okay, well, I could do that and I'm going to then go prove it. So I knew just through different like student leadership roles and things that I had been involved in in college that like I wanted to be back into that leadership role. And so that that was the ethos behind mm. getting me there. But in my head, I was thinking, I need a way to prove to this VP GM at the, at the property that I know what I'm talking about and that there's probably some new ways that I would approach leading this property. Um, that perhaps hadn't been done before. The guy in the role before me was a ex hedge fund guy, and of course, in the recession, he lost his job, so he went into an AGM into the AGM role through some like family connections, and he left to go back to the hedge fund um, when they were able to hire somebody. So that created the opening, and so I'm like, you know what? The worst case scenario is that I put this thing together, and she says no, but she likes my ideas, or she you know gives me feedback on things that I would need to do in order to become an AGM of the property. And so I put everything together and I just took a risk. And I think like there's a lot of stuff, maybe you, you gals talk about this in your coaching, but like upstairs brain, downstairs brain. And <laughs> so like downstairs brain being like the spiral or the spin that we experience when we're worried about what could happen in the future, but hasn't happened yet mm-hmm. versus the upstairs brain being the one where we make our logical decisions in the present moment. And so something I've learned throughout my career um, has been to make decisions in the upstairs brain about what I can do right now in this moment in order to take a shot and have a time, have a, have a time at bat. Yeah. That's a good point, right? Like the future doesn't really exist at this point, right? Like it's still a theory. And so, well, if I'm not then spinning out about everything that could come after this because it's all just theoretical. What would I do just looking at this job or looking at this opportunity? What would I do based on what I'm seeing right now? And you're like, well, I would pitch something. And you weren't, it doesn't sound like anyone asked you to do that. You just volunteered to put something together. I've heard people do that before and have results. So I'm like, here's an interesting question for you, I guess, is, (laughs) is going above and beyond and doing extra homework you know, a good idea if you're looking for a job and you're either you want to stand out or maybe you are not super qualified and you want to like maybe prove that you've got what it takes to actually be a candidate? I think it yes, and it depends. I think my theory behind this is if there could be any doubt as to why you would be a great fit for the role or your past Mm -hmm. experience, etc., 
then it the the onus is on you, the candidate, to prove that interviewer or that hiring manager wrong, or to give them reasonable cause that you could do 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 well in that role. And so a lot of my approaches in in the different moves that I've made have been, hey, like, you know, in my head, I'm thinking about, okay, they could have some questions about this. I don't necessarily meet this qualification. I don't have this number of years of experience, or um, they they probably have some questions about how I would approach X, Y, and Z. And then I, I tailor the way that I approach the interview in that vein so that I'm thinking about the questions that they have. And it kind of like a sales call, if you think about it, how am I overcoming those objections up front through the way yeah. in which I'm approaching the interview. Um, as someone who also has, you know, does, has done sales, I'm like, always be pitching yourself, always be spinning too. Like I'm so, <laughs> I'm so good at spinning things to be like, I'm just going to make this sound like good. And there's so, there's so many experiences that we've had, even if they're not directly relevant, that can be, you know, that can serve us and be made, you know, to, sound like, you know what? Yeah. I didn't have direct experience with that, but I could take what I've learned and adjust it and copy paste to here. Like, so yeah, yeah, a little bit of ingenuity and willingness to just, you know, say, well, again, what is the worst that's going to happen if I, if I pitch something like that, like at the very least they'll think I'm interesting or at the very least they'll think I'm determined, which are pretty good qualities to demonstrate that you have. Yes. Yeah. And I love what you just said about experience um, because I, I believe in that experiences are more valuable than experience. And there are synergies in experiences um, across all industries, across all roles. Um, and so like, whereas I maybe I hadn't led a luxury sports resort property before, I had led other teams before. And so I was yeah. able to, you know, create stories and uh, well, not really create because they were truth, but uh, I was well, able yeah, to- Well, yeah, craft though, like <laughs> craft, put it together. Yeah. Yeah. yeah put together stories um, around me leading teams and, and the, you know, challenges that come with that and the types of things that I've overcome as a result of working with different people and have that be applicable to leading a team at a sports resort property. So- Yeah. Yeah. I have so many questions for you about very disparate. They're not all, I mean, they're all in this umbrella um, of things that I'm not an expert in, but that I, you know, there's always a point in coaching where, especially when you're career coaching, Kristen and I tend to do more of the internal work that comes with career coaching. Career coaching is sort of the facade for deeper personal spiritual development. But then of course it gets to the point where it's time to take action. And so I'm always happy to talk to people who know more about the part where the rubber meets the road of, okay, I have a very solid concrete idea of who I am and what I want and what I value and the kind of people I want to work for. Like I have it in my head and now it needs to become a concrete reality. That's where people like you have more experience than me, which is why I bring you on and I want to talk to you. (laughs) So, okay. You have a lot of experience with good, you know, with crafting, crafting, there's that word again, creating, building good company cultures, which I got to tell you, that's probably one of the main reasons that a lot of the clients I've worked with have been miserable. It's not because they don't like what they're doing necessarily. It's because who they're doing it with is a toxic environment full of people who might not, most of the time, don't realize there's anything wrong with them, (laughs) Um, are often like children in adult bodies, getting triggered, overreacting, having meltdowns, having tantrums, Toxic workplaces abound. So how do people go about finding excellent places to work? I I have no idea how you're going to answer this. And so I'm very fascinated to see what comes out. So I, I truly believe that, yes, companies can have a meta culture. Let's just call it that. You know, some a, a mission statement, a vision statement, a, a set of values, sure, et cetera, right. right? That guide how we work. But the person to your point who is most in charge of someone's experience at the company is their manager. Mm-hmm. So regardless of the umbrella meta culture, yep. the manager is Good really point. the person who helps or doesn't help um, encourage that <laughs> culture or provide a great work environment. And I think a lot of the you know toxic 
work environments that are caused by managers is as a result of people getting into manager roles who shouldn't be managers, to your point, right? A child in an adult body. And they are primarily in a leadership role because that was the only path to elevate, right? And companies have set up those structures where the logical next step once you reach a certain level as an independent contributor is just to become a manager or you're a great independent contributor. So, and you're the best IC. So you're logically supposed to be a manager next is your next move. And the companies who do things right, recognize that people who should be in a manager role should be a great leader, should want to be a leader, should want to get results through other people, should want to create Mm -hmm. a really great experience for people through being a leader. And not just because you were a great IC, but it's a totally different skill set to be a leader and a manager versus an independent contributor. And neither of them are right or wrong or better or worse. It just is a different motivation and a different way of working. It's a different part that you play on a team. And so as a candidate, as you're going through interview processes, the things that you should be starting to clue into or the questions that you should be asking should be, how are you leading as a manager? What's your leadership philosophy? How do you run your leadership team? Why did you become a manager? Why did you become a leader? Like understanding the ethos behind why that leader got into the role in the first place, because high tides raise all boats. If your yeah. leader and the leader being that high tide, if, you're, if your leader is somebody who's truly in it to be a leader and to, and to inspire, to grow, to lead and teach others, you're more than likely to be in a really great role. That's a very good point. And it's true. I mean, that person has usually the most say or sway over the experience that you have on a day-to-day basis. I mean, I'm going to throw this out there because I feel like this is an, this is something I've seen happen and that maybe would be good for them to ask too and can get your feedback on. But what's the relationship like with your leadership? Because sometimes there's a good boss, but they have a terrible boss or like, you know, the higher ups are really like it's rotting, right? The fish rots from the head. Like they're the ones creating it. And I mean, it, it's kind of a bold question to ask. But also I feel like how someone answers that could be so telling to like, if they're like, oh, I love my boss. Or if they're like, uh, <laughs> they're a deer in headlights and they don't know how to answer because they don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't know. I might ask that if I were you. <laughs> I love that question. And I think if you're, if you're, if, if you ask that question and they're struggling to find the words, that's a really good clue that there's probably something up um, going on yeah. there. If the first words aren't their mouth, oh my God, oh my God, I love my boss. There's probably something happening. Um, and I, I kind of think of it as like a family system, even though I, I, I want to put this disclaimer out there. I don't think companies are families and they should never be called families. And if, no. if a company is saying like, oh, we're a tight knit family, run for the freaking hills. Oh my God. Um, wait, we have to take a tangent. Why? Yeah. Because, because a lot of people want that. They want to feel like they have a work family and they are attracted and drawn in by people who use that language. So like, tell me why that's, that's scary. So that's toxic, in my opinion, because families don't pay you and families <laughs> don't lay people off or fire people um, unless they're Very a terrible true. family, right? And so you, you, you do not have a family in your work. You are there to do a job. And yes, you can have beautiful relationships with people. And yes, you can have fun at work. And yes, you can care about the people that you work with, but they are not family. They are not going to be the ones ultimately who are going to say, oh, we can't terminate you or lay you off because we really love you. We care about you. Um, that's not a, a logical business reason, right? That, that, that just doesn't happen. And so um, it's, it becomes this like toxic recruitment tactic or retention tactic to think of yourself as a family. Because guess what happens? If God forbid something happens where you're, you're no longer working there, you get laid off or you get terminated or whatever. Like that's not a family. <laughs> that's- well, wow. Okay. I mean, Okay, so yes, this is this is brilliant. Also, the thing that's coming to my mind is most families are dysfunctional. So, if you're saying the work is like a family, what you're saying is it feels like a family because most of us the familiarity of that is coming from a place of dysfunction. Like most people don't actually have super healthy families, at least not most people I've coached, right? <laughs> like So, I mean, even that is, I think there's the implication that it's a warm, fuzzy feeling. And I'm like, um, raise your hand if you have a a family or an extended family that has no dysfunction or toxicity in it. I don't think anyone listening to this is going to be like, yep, I have a perfect family. Right. A (laughs) hundred percent. I think that's a good point. And I, I think the, 
you know, the guys that a family, like where a work family puts out there is that you're safe, right? That That is actually what I think people are trying to under, to communicate when they're saying, oh, our work team is like a yeah. family is that it's safe or that it's comfortable, right? Or that, you know, we, we, we love each other. There's um, a warmth and a connection or yeah. something. And that's all great. That's all great, but it's not your family. Mm. Okay. Well, I would not have known to ask that. So thank you for serving that up. Um, <laughs> okay. So can I, so then let me ask, if not that, if how they describe themselves should not be, we are a family, what are some kind of I guess, green flags of how a company should be talking about themselves that that's actually going to maybe demonstrate we're safe. We actually are non-toxic. I know you can't totally know, but I think there's Mm -hmm. some usually good signs, right? So one of the hidden reasons why people talk about their team as a family or why they may want to talk about it is, is really like the things that are involved in a family, right? There's growth, there's mentorship, there's care, there's concern, there's proximity. Um, and all of those things are super important. So for example, one question that you could ask to um, identify whether or not a team is healthy or not is um, to the hiring manager, hey, can you tell me your favorite story of the person of one person that you've mentored or you've had on your team and the growth trajectory of that person, where that person has is mm-hmm. now as a result of working with you? And that can be a really great indicator about a couple of things. One, are they able to come up with something really instantly? Are they able to have like those stories that they can tell immediately about people that they've grown and people that have gone on to do really awesome things? Two, what is their approach to growth and development? How, how did they get that person to the next level? So I love that question because it really it, it, t- it tells a couple of different data points to you. I, again, wouldn't have thought to phrase it quite like that, but that is, yeah, that's excellent. And I also, you know, I don't have experience as a, really as an, inter- as an interviewer of candidates or as, you know, like even someone who's applied for a ton of jobs. I've been doing this since I was 25. So I haven't applied for or had a ton of jobs, thank God. Um, <laughs> but I think that I think that the thing that I've I've told people very consistently is if someone has a good answer to your question, it should probably it will be natural. And if they don't, you're gonna see them stumble, you're gonna see them falter. They're not gonna be able to come up with a good answer to your question. So if they really have mentored someone, if they really are a good leader, they're gonna be able to just speak to that plainly without looking like they're scrambling. If they're scrambling, yeah. that's a red flag. It is. It is a red flag. And it's kind of a like inner gut feeling that we just get yeah. as human beings. It's a combined with the vernacular that's coming out of their mouth. But yeah, I I, I agree. Are there other red flags that we should be wary of beyond companies describing themselves as a family? <laughs> um, I think also asking why the the job is vacant. So why... Very is, good point. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. why did this role come about? And the reason I say that is because, you know, was there somebody in the role who wasn't a great fit? Why weren't they great a fit? A great fit. That's that could be a follow up question to that. Yeah. Or if it's a newly created role, what are they hoping that this role will create? Why was our uh, was this role will do, and why was it created? Is that an, a sign of growth that there's a ton of opportunity right now? The company's in an expansion mode, um, etc. So asking why the role is vacant, and I would also say um, that like team dynamics in terms of how that leader, the person that you'd be working for runs their team. So what does a week on the team look like? A day in the week, a week in the week um, look like for how that leader runs the team? Are they are they bringing folks together for a stand-up every Monday? Or they, do they have a team meeting every week? Are there one-on-ones that are happening? And just you know, as a result of listening to their answer, getting in your body for a second, see how does that feel? Do I like that approach? Do I like that uh, way that the leader's kind of setting up the way that they run their team? And because I, I work with some clients who are like, I just want to do my job. I want to check off the boxes. I, I do want, a, obviously, a relationship with my manager, but I don't like to be micromanager. I don't like to be in a lot of meetings. Versus someone who's like, I, I love that connection. I love the synergy. I love you know working cross-functionally with other folks on the team. And so therefore, a team that's run, that has a little bit more time together, especially in a remote environment like we're in right now, is more important to me. And so I think understanding the way in which the team operates is also super important to know about as well. I mean, I... Nothing more to add. All I mean, like, yeah, this is like classic stuff and very good things that you should be asking if you're looking for a job. Okay. 
you have a lot more experience um, compared to my nun with recruiting people. And, you know, I, that's really the biggest struggle that most of the people hit when they, once again, once they get to that point where they know what they want is just finding it. And from my impression, you're going to tell me if I'm wrong about this. I feel like the ways you get a job have not really changed that much. There's, there, there's really only a handful of them. You can find something online and apply for it. If you, you can network and like be introduced to someone who knows someone, maybe you reach out and do some informational interviews. That's part of networking. You can maybe work with a recruiter. There's just not a lot of, I mean, when it comes down to it, there's only a couple of ways that you actually end up getting a job. And yet it still feels so hard and daunting and complicated. So, you know, I guess this is, feels like kind of a a very basic question that you can build off of, but how the heck do we find jobs in a, (laughs) in a way that will not make us insane or drained or want to just like quit and, you know, work at Starbucks or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Forbes recently came out with a study that that showed that 88% of hires that were made in the last two years were made through referrals. So that means that only 12% of hires wow. are done through applications. And so, you know, I, I, I do a web class every week and, um, you know, I, I, I've, I've taught this to thousands of people at this point. But one of the co- most common things that I see from the attendees in, in my course is, has been, you know, I just I've applied to hundred different jobs or two hundred different jobs online through an yeah, application. I can, I can verify a lot of my clients are feeling <laughs> that pain. Yeah, yeah. And what I will tell you is, you gotta stop doing that. You have to stop spending your time, you know, uh, crafting your resume to every single job that you apply for and just hitting that submit button. That's n- it's only going to be successful twelve percent of the time. So why are you spending your time there? Right, bad and odds. So- why would we play those odds? Yeah, exactly. You've got to play the numbers game. And so to your earlier point, my recommendation is that you have to start having conversations with people who are in your dream job, who are in the role that you want, because they are the ones that are hanging out in the circles that are hiring for those the type of role that you want. And if you can create those connections without asking for a job, but if you can interview those people, informational interviews, I call them power chats. Um, If you can have a power chat with people who uh, you're interviewing about what they do, why they're doing it, how they got to where they are, any advice that they would have for for, uh, someone in your shoes, you're creating a genuine connection, which could lead to a referral. Um, And that, that is the key. That is the secret sauce to getting hired in today's job market. Okay. So multi-tiered questions based on that. What advice do you have for introverts who are terrified of this idea? <laughs> and, and I mean, like social anxiety introverts, I'm sure some extroverts are like, I love people, but that scares me. So any kind of feedback that you get from the more shy, um, socially awkward people who do not like to hear that advice? <laughs> <laughs> totally. So um, chances are when you're feeling that angst over having a conversation with someone that you don't know, it's not because you're bad at it. It's because you're unprepared. And it's because you don't know what to say or what you're going to say. And so uh, my advice is to take out a piece of paper. These, these talks are only 20 to 30 minutes. So in the grand scheme of your life, this is small pain for a lot of gain. So first kind of getting over, over, over how quick these conversations can be. And then taking out a piece of paper and writing down five to 10 questions that you want to find out about this person, the things that interest you, the things that you're curious about, how they got into their role, what was important to them when they were uh, job searching like you, because everybody is job searching at some point. And you're just asking for advice. You're positioning yourself as a student. And when you position yourself as a student and not as an expert or not as somebody that you're trying to impress, you're just seeking some advice. It makes the conversation less um, taxing and and less has have less weight to it because you're just asking questions. Um, you're not actually the one doing all the talking. You're just the one interviewing. Um, I had a client who had a who's had a lot of. Um, I don't know. She hasn't gotten a new job yet, but she's had a lot of enjoyment and learning out of doing informational interviews. She said it's been a great exercise for her. And one of the things it most helped her with is to really change the people pleasing knee jerk that comes up when you sit down with someone who might be like in a, a an impressive 
role who's kind of beyond you and you're intimidated. She's like, I find myself, I found myself going into those wanting to say the right thing. And I'm like, you're not there to say the right thing. You're there to learn. They're like, it's not about you at all. So absolutely like don't go in there trying to be perfect. Go in there literally just earnestly trying to learn. And yes. people, I find people like, like uh, teaching people and like mentoring people and like giving them feedback. Also like talking about themselves and their experiences. And I guess that leads me to another question, which is, I think a lot of people also have fears of asking for those types of conversations without sounding like the classic, I'm just trying to, can I pick your brain? They don't want to sound annoying. They don't want to sound like they're, I mean, people are strapped for time, so they don't want to sound like they're being disrespectful of other people's time. So what advice or feedback do you give people for like the best way to pitch it without, you know, without being rejected? (laughs) You're going to get rejected. I'm sure. Right. There's like, you're going to get rejected, but best chance of success at not getting rejected. Yeah. The best chance of not getting rejected is by, again, playing the game of odds and reaching out to a number of people and being yeah. consistent in, in reaching out to a number of people um, and, and filling up that pipeline with as many potential yeses as you can so that you end up actually netting out with all those people who say, no, I don't have time or just don't respond at all um, to people who actually do and, and, mm-hmm. and, and want to do it. But in terms of like the nomenclature, the vernacular to use, it really is just positioning yourself as a student. And so, you know, hey, Rachel, um, I'm, you know, my name is AJ. I'm, I'm interested in, um, in your career path and how you, got, how you became a coach. Um, and I'm just curious if you would uh, be willing to spend 15 or 20 minutes to give me some advice for people who are in my shoes. And, 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 and saying, can you give me some advice versus can I pick your brain? Ooh, um, yeah. Be, because then you're positioning that person as a, as a subject matter expert. They're kind of getting a little flattered as a result of being looked at that way that you found them on LinkedIn or wherever you find them. Um, and it kind of changes the tone of the conversation. What well, also changes the subject? Can I pick your brain about me? Can you give me advice about you? So Bingo. it makes it less self-centered. Yeah. yeah. Um. Okay. So where do people, I mean, again, I'm like so basic that I'm like, where are they finding these people? LinkedIn, I'm assuming, or, or is there, is there a better way to actually go about finding people to have those conversations with that I don't know about? Yeah. LinkedIn definitely is number one. That's the first way. And the search functionality on LinkedIn has improved so much over the, over the years that you can find pretty much anybody in any role in any state, any city. Um, it's, it's awesome. Um, there's tools like sales navigator. There's tools like um, LinkedIn recruiter or just LinkedIn premium that give you more search capabilities. So that's definitely number one. The other things are, are and I'm not sponsored or anything, but um, rocket reach is a really great tool. So like once you find somebody on LinkedIn and they're maybe they're not responding to you on LinkedIn, you can actually find their email address um, by uh, installing a plugin on your Chrome browser. Um, no idea this existed. This is creepy, but also like, Hey, yeah. If everyone else, this is like the kind of <laughs> the downside of like our AI to our, our AI future is just like, well, everyone else is doing it. Who cares if it's, is this ethical? Let's just do it. It's fine. <laughs> well, there's a difference between like reaching out over and over and over again and being obnoxious and abusing totally. that information versus like a genuine request for advice um, once or twice. Yeah. And then if they don't respond, like moving on. Um, sure. So that's, I guess, another piece I would recommend. Too. Yeah, totally. Like be polite, yeah. do not send someone 20 emails. Yeah. Um, how many, I mean, I know we're getting into the nitty gritty, but I can hear some of the people who would be interested in this asking these questions. So like, mm-hmm. you know, you send one, maybe you send a follow-up if you haven't heard from them after that, is it, you wash your hands of it? Do you reach yes. out a third time? Move right along after the move second right reach along. out, move okay. right along. Yep. Move to the next. Okay. And I know they're going to be wondering this too. When you said, you know, you got to reach out to like a several people. How many people do you really have to reach out to? Like, give me numbers. (laughs) 20 a day. So a hundred a week. A hundred a week. Okay. So for those who are like, no, 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 I don't have time for that. Well, I guess then what I would say is do what you can, but you know, I, it, if you reach out to the same amount of people and it takes you five months instead of one month, well, you, you still reached out to the same amount of people. It's just your timeline might be a little bit longer. And yes. that's probably okay too. Yes, 100%. And 
if you really think about it, it takes you what 20 seconds to hit a connect button and add a note to a connection request on LinkedIn. Like it doesn't really take that yeah. long. But what I hear often, I hear that a lot from clients. Oh my God, 20 a day, 100 a week. What am I? What? Uh, how am I going to have all that time? And what I say is, well, every, every second, every minute of every day, we are choosing how to spend our time. And so we make time for things that are important to us. And so to your point is, you know, if it's really important to me that I get out of my job or find a new job ASAP, you will make time to to send out those connection requests. And if and if you're like, oh, I can, you know, I can take my time, I can be a little bit more strategic about it, or I can do it when I can just fill some holes because of other things that are going on in my life, that's okay too. It just might extend the amount of time that it takes for you to land that new thing. I think another question that would be coming up or fear or concern or whatever after hearing, oh my God, 20 a day, like indefinitely. Uh no, I want to go bury myself in a hole. I do not like that. Um is okay, but I don't even think I could think of, I don't know if I could come up with 20 people I would want to talk to who are in a role that I would want to do. And a lot of the times, I'm not sure people are yet at the point where they know exactly what they are looking for. I think that a lot of the time what we find is that they're very clear on their deeper values. They're very clear on who they are. They're very clear on how they want to feel when they're at work, but they're also very open to what that could look like at their job. Like, I could work at a tech company. I could work at a nonprofit. It's really more about who I'm working with and do I care about you know, what I'm doing, but I'm open to what I could be doing. So I guess when it's this volume of people, my guess is what you're going to say, tell me if I'm wrong, is it's, you know, is there something interesting about that person that I, that I am, that I want to learn more about, or do they work at a company that I find intriguing and I genuinely like want to know what their experience is like? It doesn't have to be like, do I want to do exactly what they're doing? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, I, the, the strategy works both ways, whether you are um, trying to figure out what you want to be doing with your life and what, what sure. direction you want to take, or you know exactly what you want to do. And then the conversation is really more about how that person got to what, what they're doing and how you know their feelings about the company and what they would do if they were you and, and um, you wanted to be in their shoes. So yes, the, it's, the strategy works both ways. But what I'll say is to, to folks who are still trying to understand and decide what they want to do, maybe they're picking between two or three different types of routes that they want to go, is that these power chats will give you the, the knowledge to help form that opinion. And so I, I know, yeah, I'm sure you experienced this too, Rachel. Um, but when I talk to clients who, are, who, who don't know what they want to do, they're, they're typically spinning, again, in that anxiety bubble again, like worried about the future and, and something that hasn't happened yet. And so what I tell them is that you're going to have to step outside of your comfort zone a little bit and have some, some conversations with people that you're curious about or roles that you're curious about to understand a little bit more about what it's like to work in that environment to give you that gut internal reaction on whether or not that's going to be a good fit. And I talk all the time about the difference between our cortex and our amygdala. Um, I don't want to bore, bore you with brain science, but... I mean, I... I'm I know and I think <laughs> most of the people here are not going to be bored by that cuz they love this stuff and they're yeah. up on the brain they get that <laughs> Yeah <laughs> So like the amygdala and the cortex right the amygdala is like the part that's actually concerned with the emotions that we're feeling it's the, it's the uh, part of our brain that tells us that that thing is hot or ow that hurts or things like that and the cortex is literally the one that's making decisions on how not to die <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> so the rational part of our brain, the, the part of our brain that, that keeps us alive. And so constantly in our brain, we're fighting this, this conversation between our amygdala, the emotions that we have, and our cortex, what's going to keep us from quote unquote dying. And so what typically keeps us in like analysis paralysis or, or not moving forward is this decision that our cortex has made to rationalize what the amygdala is feeling and therefore not let us do the thing that we actually think we need to be doing. So I always say like, it's going to feel uncomfortable, especially like you were saying about people who are introverts, it's going to feel uncomfortable for the first time in it. And that's okay, but that's growth. That, um, and that is a sign that you're actually retraining the conversation between your amygdala and your cortex yeah. about what is safe? Yeah. Discomfort is not necessarily to be avoided. It's often to be leaned into because it's the only way that you can kind of get over yourself and become more resilient, right? Like, yes. yeah. And the more you do it, the it's exposure therapy, the less freaked out you get. Yeah. The more your amygdala calms down yeah. and, and you're, and you learn more and you build more confidence in yourself that way. 
And so I might suggest some of the people listening to this, you can start small. You don't have to start out with 20 a day if that freaks you out. Like maybe start where start with where you can because if you're doing something, you're probably it's probably better than sending off endless job applications into the void, right? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Um, Okay. So what kind of questions, I know it depends probably a little bit on the kind of person you're talking to, but I'm, I'm guessing you might have some best practices around questions to ask when you have a power chat. I'm going to call them, I'm going to try to remember to call them power chats from now on. Like what kind of questions do people typically ask in a good power chat? So typically it's, uh, you know, tell me about how you got into your role. Um, tell me about how you, um, uh, what it's like working at the company. Um, you can talk about how they feel about uh, working as a blah, 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 whatever they are. Um, you could ask questions around um, where, where, what they would do if they were in your shoes, given your background. So that it's a little bit more customized to where you are um, and, and how they would approach Landing that job, especially that's great for career changers. So people who are, let's say, you know, salespeople and want to become project managers, and you're talking to a project manager, what advice would they give you about how to make that pivot? What's important in an in an interview with your company? What are the types of things that uh, people would want to see? And then I have a, a thing that's called the power question, and oh. this is the this is the question that you must ask in every single power chat, and the okay. power question is. What is the biggest challenge on your team right now? And then you're going to have that person answer. You're going to jot down their notes, uh, your notes on, on what they say. And then a day or two later, you're going to respond back with an email. And in that email, you're going to say, Hey, Rachel, it was so great chatting with you. I learned so much and I really appreciated your advice. Oh, and by the way, you mentioned your biggest challenge at the team right now. I've put together three to 10 ideas of what I would do to help solve those challenges. And then in those, I know Mm. I saw your eyebrows. And then in Mm. your bullets, you're writing, I would do this. I would do this. I would do this. I would do this. Again, three to 10 doesn't need to be, they don't need to be so drawn out. They're just little bullet points. And then you fire it off. And that way you've done three things. You've provided value by helping them think about another way to solve the problem. You've shown expertise without asking for a job and you've flattered them by asking them for their advice. This is such a unique take that I never would have thought of. And it's very, it's fun. It's bold. It's a little bit bold. It's like a little bit presumptuous, but I like it. You know what I mean? It's like, listen, you didn't ask for, you didn't ask for this. Here you go. Um, And I can feel some of the people listening to this going, oh, that's uncomfortable. And it's like, yes. And that's often how you get hired just by like, doing like that next level uncomfortable thing. Because what's the worst that's going to happen? They just ignore you. They just say, oh, cool, thanks. You don't really understand the problem. Like, okay, well, then you probably didn't want to work with that person at that place anyway. So fine, fine. A hundred percent, right? And you have to stand out in today's job market. There's more jobs or there's more people out there looking for jobs than there are jobs available. And so you have to stand out. Um, and sending an application online is not standing out. Um, but having these types of conversations and putting yourself out there, being a little bit bold in in doing so is the, is the name of the game. And that's what helps people just get into the side door of companies, but also um, increases the chances that that person that you interviewed could introduce you to other people who might be hiring or who might be mm-hmm. needing to solve a problem um, similar to what that person mentioned. Okay. I, I could probably keep on, keep on, keep on, keep on like forever, but I do want to ask because I know it was something that when you originally emailed me, you guys will not be surprised to hear that AJ pitched us to come on the <laughs> podcast because he's clearly very good at pitching. And I said, yes. And I very rarely, I want you to know, I very rarely say yes to anyone oh. most of the time because they never even act like they've looked at our website, never even glanced at the name of one of our episodes. Listen to it. No. Definitely not. Um, It's so impersonal. It's just copied and pasted. And I'm like, delete, delete, delete. Even if something could be interesting, I'm like, nope, you didn't put any effort in and I'm not here for that. So he put a little bit of effort in, not a maximum effort, just a little bit of effort. And I was like, thank you. And then I wanted to talk to him. So (laughs) proving that he knows what he's doing just in that. (laughs) But when you originally um, reached out, you mentioned, you know, job seeking in COVID times. So I do want to ask, I mean, I know the world is like sort of maybe potentially heading back to normal, but 
I don't, the world is, we're going to be working so much more remotely now indefinitely. Like, I think that the, we have had a huge shift in how we're going to work period from here on out. So I am curious if there's things we need to know specifically around looking for jobs, positioning ourselves, like interviewing all of that stuff in a time of COVID. So one of the things that's changing a lot is this um, concept of remote working and, and companies hiring people outside of their city that they're established in or you know their state, whatever. And so one of the things that you could be missing out on is that if you're not setting your search filters to remote opportunities um, onto your you know LinkedIn or Indeed or wherever you're searching for jobs, um, just so making sure that you're looking at remote opportunities because if you're just looking in like let's say. San Francisco, California, um, you're not going to see other cool companies that could be hiring that are comfortable with you working remotely. So that'd be my first thing. The second is to get really comfortable with interviewing over the camera. And Mm -hmm. so it's, it's like really simple stuff, like how you're framed in the picture, what that looks like, what your background's like. It sounds so rudimentary, but I can't tell you how many clients I work with where (laughs) <laughs> like the camera is like cutting off their chin and it like, or there's like a closet with clothes hanging in it in the background. And you're right. like, Ugh. yeah, it, they, it, it, unfortunately there's a lot of biases, like unconscious biases that come with making totally. assumptions about what, what things look like on the, on the frame. So like really basic stuff, have a great fr- um, uh, picture yourself in a really great frame on the camera. You also need to send about two times as much energy through the camera as you do in person, just so that the camera captures it and it translates to the other side. Yeah. So it's like you're in a stage enough. production. It's like you have to like have big features because yeah, no, it's true. You'll just kind of look dead eyed or whatever yeah. if you're just listening, right? Yeah. 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 And then the third I would say is just lighting. So just making sure that you yeah. like, you can be seen. You're not like in a dark place. You're not getting backlit by something so people can't see your facial expressions and, yes. and uh, see how Invest excited you are. in like a ring light or yeah. I have one that just like suctions to the back of... I'm not using it right now, but suctions to the back of the laptop and like instant, yeah. like good Dude, lighting. $15 on Amazon. Like they're, it's not a, it's not yeah. a expensive investment. Okay. All right. So nothing, nothing drastic, just like mind our P's and Q's. Like if you, it's no different than going to an in-person interview. Like you're trying to be on your, you're trying to look the best. You're trying yeah. to make a good impression. Right. It's just slightly just different the time. Yeah. And I would just say like the, the difference is like, take the time to actually like worry about the things that could affect how people understand and, and get to know who you are um, on, on camera, your audio, um, your background, yeah. um, and and then again, those remote opportunities. Okay. So I think I'm going to ask you because I, I don't know what I don't know. Is there anything that you wish that I had asked or that you could have spoken to that I have not? Um, I think the only other thing that I'll say is this um, ever prevailing theme of avoidance that hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of people talk about um, or, or just experience as, as they're thinking about things that they wanted to do with their career, for, but for whatever reason, they decided they couldn't um, or a direction that they wanted to take and, and something came in the way. And so they decided to kind of go on this path of things that they were good at, but they don't like doing. <clears throat> and I think when we avoid the thing that is ultimately going to bring us joy or fulfillment in our in our lives, we're doing ourselves a a a disservice. But b we're actually like contributing to a pressure um, increase in let's you know in the kettle um, that we eventually are going to need to release, and that can come out in things like poor mental health, low engagement, like yeah. snapping on a coworker, like snapping to your spouse, um, like. Like we have to recognize and do the work to understand what we're avoiding, uh, what have we been avoiding, and how do we make just slight changes to get more in alignment with what we want to be doing in our life and get comfortable with being uncomfortable, um, and 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 then and pursuing the thing that really makes us happy. So, uh, just because you decided to go one direction in your career is great, but that doesn't mean that you can't shift, and that doesn't mean that you're stuck. And that doesn't mean that you um, can't make a, a change if you need to. You can you can still have ha- had a great career, and you can still decide that like that doesn't work for you anymore, and you want to change. Amen. Um, <laughs> yeah, I did think of one more question. If you have time, sure. Okay. Um, 
you have experience recruiting people. And um, I think a lot of the time people are attracted to the idea of working with a recruiter or a headhunter or something like that. And they don't necessarily know how to go about doing that. Because I think sometimes they're wary of, am I just going to be a number? Are they going to listen to me? Am I just going to be like a job they're trying to fill? If sending out you know, resumes into the void doesn't work and, you know, um, doing power chats works the best, you know, is working with a recruiter something people should consider or, and if so, like how might be the best way for them to actually approach that? Yes. Working with a recruiter can be wonderful, but there's a few caveats. So the first is that you have to know what you want to be doing with your life or with your career. Um, yeah. Working with a recruiter is not a substitute for a career coach. They're not going to be able to help you pivot or career change. Sure. Yeah. They are hired by the company to fill a square peg with a square hole, literally the exact carbon copy of what they're looking for. Right. So <clears throat> if you're just looking to make a change uh, to like the company and you want to keep doing the same job, a hundred percent reach out to recruiters because they they can help put other things on your on your plate. If you're looking to make um, a huge shift in what you're doing, recruiters are not going to be someone that you're going to you're going to want to work with. Interesting. Okay, that's not something I think I would have known. I think I would have thought like, all right, uh, I was an engineer. I want to make a pivot. I know what I want to pivot to. Are you saying a recruiter might not be that helpful because you don't have like the technical experience? Yeah. So because like, they're I'll just you- looking to like kind of copy paste and you know play by the rules, so to speak. Well, they're hired by the company, right? So you are right. not hiring the recruiter. The the company is hiring them to find exactly what they're like that company is looking for. And so if you're, let's say, again, I'll use the example, if you're in sales and you want to move to project management, they're that company is going to look for from that recruiter people who are in project management roles. They're, you know, at, at, at a series mm-hmm. of different companies and and largely at comp at um candidates who are currently employed somewhere and they're trying to take them away. Um, in a project management role. And um, if you were to come to me as a salesperson and say that you want to become a project manager, I wouldn't feel comfortable presenting you to my client because I don't you don't have the the necessary project management skills, and let's just say that's the case. Um, you you wouldn't have the necessary skills that my client would be happy with. And so once you've made a career change and you're maybe two, one, two, three years into your career in that new type of role, that's the point at which I would start developing mm. relationships with recruiters because then they can start piling things and opportunities and running those by you. It kind of annoys me because I'm like, I know. It, we're, we're hiring for like the, the logical kind of resume reasons and we're not actually hiring the person. Um, and, but okay. So then, sorry, I'm like, and another thing. <laughs> um, but that, but then I guess I don't want to leave this point hanging out. Cause I'm sure there are people listening who really are curious. Then if you are looking to make a big pivot and again, maybe you've worked with a coach and so you know what, what you're pivoting to, but you're having trouble getting there. Then what's kind of the advice for people who are pivoting and apparently working with a recruiter is not the best strategy for them. Is it power so, chats? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it's power chats and it's working with people um, or, or talking to people who have made perhaps similar moves. And like, and listen, I 100% get it. You don't get experience without getting experience. And so you yeah. have to, you, you have to at some point, right? It comes to catch 22. You have to at some point get that experience. But the way that you do that is not through a recruiter. A recruiter is not going to say, um, you know, oh, you're a project manager and I can I can flip you into being a great salesperson or I can brand you as a salesperson when I go talk to my client. There could, I will give this other caveat, there could be some synergies between what you're doing in project management or perhaps you were in a hybrid role and you did some sales. And so therefore, there may be some selling points that that recruiter can take to their client. Um, and when I talk about recruiter, I'm talking about external recruiters. So recruiters who are working at a recruiting firm, not an right. internal recruiter. Um but if uh, if there are no synergies and there you're making like maybe a complete 180 and changing directions, you're going to want to do it through power chats and not through a, a recruiting agency. Okay, interesting. So then, is an internal recruiter? Hold on, I'm like trying to put the math together on this. Yeah. I'm like, does this really check out? Because I'm like, you know, an internal recruiter. I feel like so many resumes come through, like come their way, and yet 88 percent of the time, that's that's not where we're getting hired. So mm-hmm. it's like, is the internal recruiter just like solely relying on other people to refer? And 
are they really going out and looking or are they waiting, waiting for people to come to them? I'm like, isn't recruitment about going out and hunting? Yes. So some, (laughs) sometimes, yes. So sometimes those internal and external recruiters are going out and hunting. But if you think about it, they are kind of the intermediary between the candidate and the hiring manager. So the hiring manager is receiving a candidate from a recruiter, whether or not it was a referral or whether or not it was someone that that they hunted, they're getting a candidate from someone that they know, like, and trust that recruiter who's Mm. able to speak to that candidate, who's able to understand their background, who's able to sell and talk about how they could add value to the hiring manager once they make that introduction. And so it's kind of like, it it still is a referral. It still is a a power chat because that recruiter is that person that the hiring manager knows, likes, and trusts um, to be able to, to figure out the, the, the rest. Um, it's, it's, um, to your point that there's a lot of folks who apply to jobs online again that 12% that we were talking about and yes sometimes recruiters will go in and they'll look at the applications and they might see somebody that they want to talk to that they haven't reached out to but again they're going to have that conversation with somebody and then make a recommendation to the hiring manager gotcha. i think you should talk to this person okay and still still there it's not likely that that's going to happen cuz 12% yeah yep. okay mm-hmm. all right just curious how the mechanics of this all come together. Yeah. Um, I could talk to you forever about this stuff, apparently. Um, <laughs> but your day, your day is almost over. So um, and you have plenty to say on your own platforms. So tell people where they can get connected with you. Sure. So you can check me out on on the website, which is thehumanreach.com. Um, you can follow me on all social channels. I'm just AJ Mises everywhere, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. LinkedIn. Um, And then I also hold a free web class every week on job searching and finding your dream career where I kind of go into more in depth than some of the points I talked about today. And you can sign up for that at findmydreamcareer.com. I think I'm going to have a lot of people who are going to come your way because... I'm excited. it's, it's, It's so... It's nice to have people who can hold your hand throughout that process because it can be very arduous and draining and demoralizing. Like it's very easy to get depressed and to feel like this is never going to work. And so to have people who are championing you and teaching you how to do it and to pitfalls to avoid things to do really helpful. So thank you for this conversation. I have learned, I have learned things that it's going to change how I speak to some of my clients when we get to this point in the process. Um, so thank you. Rachel, it's been such a pleasure. I I just (laughs) love this conversation too. And thank you for having me. All right. Bye. Bye. Okay. Maybe weird time to make this announcement after having an expert on. I always think it's funny to be like, here's this expert, go listen to them. And then it's like, but now back to me, (laughs) Um, but back to me Mm -hmm. and Kristen. Uh, So we are going to be bringing, this is just an FYI. Okay. Nothing to do yet. It's for your edification. FYI. (laughs) <laughs> you know that maybe Brits say it that way. Maybe. Um, we're bringing back coaching enrollment next month. Okay. So for those of you who are like, what is that? Oh, well, that's not what I there was There are say, some people yes. who maybe are new and are like, what is the enrollment period for coaching? Well, we take on clients only three times a year. It's not an all the time basis. And no. we open up the doors for about two weeks at a time. Two weeks or less. Or less. And that's going to be happening in three weeks. May weeks from today. 14th, it will be beginning. So okay. there's nothing to do yet, yep. but for some of you, this might be, you know, might be a pretty big decision. Financially, time-wise, you want to just kind of make sure, hey, is that, does that fit with what I need right now? We're giving you a few weeks to think about it to go read our one-on-one coaching page on our site, which is linked in the episode description. And just kind of start to think about, could this be the right timing for me? You can also just go to clarionfire.com, go to work with us tab. There's a one-on-one coaching page. You should read about it. You know what I think we should do? And I'm going to say this now because then by the time this episode airs, we might need to like slap up a section on our site about this. Okay. It shouldn't take us too long. I think we should have some episodes to listen to on the one-on-one coaching page if you want to listen more about how one-on-one coaching with us works. We've That's had a, a couple idea. episodes where we get into that. And that way, instead of asking us, or you know, needing to wonder, you can just go listen mm-hmm. to some episodes we recommend if you want to okay, know more. So we're telling you that it's there as we record this. It is not there, but by the time you're listening, manifestation works. <laughs> it will be there. So that's magical. Yeah. Um, 
I highly recommend that you just start thinking about it. If if you've been wondering, should I do this? Or I really want to do this. Just know, get ready. It's coming. And mm-hmm. we'll, you know, be hitting it harder and talking about it more every week leading up to that. <laughs> and then during that. Uh, and it'll be limited. Remember, like Kristen and I can't just we work with 30 people yeah, a week. We have I a wish. limited bandwidth. I wish I could work with 15 people a week. I wish I could work with 10 people a week. <laughs> right. I I prefer to work with eight people a week. I'm like, even that is a lot of calls. It is because we really want to put a lot into it and we don't, we don't want it, it to be like a machine <laughs> um, where people are getting lost in the shuffle. Like we no. take it. I don't pretty... want to forget your name. Right. Right. I don't know how people coach, you know, dozens of people at a time. I That's just, to me. How are you doing a good job with how, any of those people? Yeah. How are you really giving them each your all? So we are pretty committed to keeping our numbers low for that reason. So we don't have a ton of spots. And what always happens when we announce this is we always get some people reaching out ahead of time. And so not even all the spots are always full or available Yeah, on day one. So just know that. If you listen to this episode with AJ and you're like, that's cool. I wish I knew what I wanted to do so that I could then go job search. Uh, you need to talk to us. Yeah, start start here. <laughs> if you know what you want, then just take AJ's advice and go with go it. Go for it. Uh, if you're not so sure what direction you're headed, and not only that, you're questioning everything in your life, you might be having a little existential panic, maybe questioning your entire life's purpose and direction. Mm, that's our specialty. That's what we are here for. Mm-hmm. We roll around in that like pigs in shit. <laughs> what a visual. <laughs> You can mm. well Scarlett does that with with shit too. It's not just pigs. Goose poop. In Dogs love it too. No, she likes to eat that, not just Ugh. roll around in it. I actually never seen her roll in it. Only eat it. Mm, yeah. It must lovely. be a delicacy to Labradors. Mm-hmm. Anyway, <laughs> we've talked about rolling in shit. I've plucked hair out of your head. Anything else we need to do today that's <laughs> very basic an and hygienic, I guess, mm-hmm. or not hygienic? No? Okay, good. I think we're good. Checked all those boxes. Great. Um, Okay, so let's talk about what's happening next week. What? Oh, we're we're, we're still talking. Okay. Um, (laughs) Oh, we're having a bonus book club next Friday. I apologize. I'm dumb. I should have told you guys this at the beginning of the month. We always say we're going to do that. I think we've done it maybe once. I don't really expect you to read. I just expect you to come and listen and get inspired to read the book. I think that's why I don't really remember to talk about it because I don't see it as like a read along. I see it as a hey, here's a book you might never have heard of. Consider it. It's almost like an hour long teaser for the book when we do our It's like a cliff episode. notes of the book that might get you some of the best nuggets from it. So you, maybe you don't even have to read it or give you some inspiration to go dive in deeper yourself. Mm-hmm. So we are going to be reading, or we have read by the point you're hearing this, <laughs> uh, Radiant Rest by mm-hmm. Tracy Stanley. It is a book all about yoga nidra which is the yoga of sleep. It's and like sleep on steroids. It's it, the best. Literally, the science says that if you can, if you can like kind of master yoga nidra, it is like it mimics while you're conscious the deep sleep state. So you're like sleeping without having to sleep. I'm like, sign me up. <laughs> Give me some of that. So oh yeah. I uh, am excited about this. This is a really good and honestly, it's not a super long book. So if no, you, and it comes if with. If you got um, it today, you might be able to even read it before a book it comes. Next with downloads too, so you could you could actually like practice some of them. Try her mm-hmm. guiding you through it. So anyway, we're gonna be talking about that because the last book club we had was the Artist Way, and you and I were like in our feelings about it, and it was hard. And the book before that was really was the body keeps the score and, and also hard emotional. And so this time we're reading a book about resting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> So we will be back next Friday. All right. We'll see you then. Bye.